we will find Adolfo speaking to us, and he will talk about time TBS faults, uh, deformation stability, and holography. So, so, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm sorry also for all these technical problems. So I'm really happy to be back in Santiago talking about this because when we started thinking of uh, thinking about these S faults, it was in 2020, and then I, I spoke at Iberian when it was here in Santiago. And then after that, I never spoke in person again till, uh, till this thing, so till today. So it's a, a pleasure to, to sort of resume and show you that indeed there was something true in all this uh, problem. So I'm gonna tell you today a bit about some kind of solutions in type to be supergravity that go under the name of uh, S-Falls. And in particular, I will show you exactly, or let's say how these solutions look like what kind of deformations can you do, and what kind of open questions they trigger as far as stability and also holography are concerned. So this is work that has been done in, I will focus on these last three papers from the last year, which have been done in collaboration always with Colin Sterks, who is my PhD student in at ULB and in Oviedo, so he's co-supervised, he's, uh, he's doing the PhD in both places. And then the last paper, which has been also done in collaboration with Alfredo Giambrone, Emmanuel Malek, Henning Santeleven, and Mario Grigianti, in different institutions in Europe. I think you can wear, take off the mask if you like. Can I take it off? Yeah. Oh, great. Even better. So then the summary of the talk is the following. I will discuss what these useful solutions are, and then it will be useful to describe them in 10 dimensions, which is the way that essentially we found them. But then also it will be important to understand them from a four-dimensional perspective, and you will see why. Then we will study the formations of these solutions, and in particular, some very peculiar deformations that were puzzling us for months. And then I will discuss these deformations also at the level of 10 dimensions and at the level of four dimensions. Then I will start some discussion, or I will enter some discussion on the stability of some of these uh, uh, S-fold solutions, in particular non-supersymmetric ones, because the supersymmetric ones are, of course, stable. And then I will also mention in the end some holographic aspects of these S-fold solutions and also some open questions that are there. Here we go. So let me start just by showing what are these uh, type 2 s fold solutions from a 10-dimensional perspective. So the idea is the following. All these backgrounds, all these type 2 s folds, they are always of the form ADS4 process one process five, as simple as that. Right? So there is a four dimensional piece, which is the ADS factor. And then there is a circle, which is the S1. And then there is the below five sphere for everyone working on type two. So, I'm sorry, I thought there was So you can think of these solutions, as I said, as 10 dimensional backgrounds, and then they are this form. But then you could also think of these solutions as solutions in an effective five dimensional supergravity which is the famous uh, SO6 gauge supergravity that you obtain when you do dimensional reduction of type 2b on the 5 SCL. But then I will not discuss almost at all the 5D interpretation of these solutions. What I will do is to go one further dimension down by taking an additional reduction on a circle, S1. And this circle is gonna play an essential role in all this S4 construction. And from this moment on, I will call the coordinate along this S1 eta. It's going to be like the most important coordinate uh, of the day. So there is something interesting about these s folds and is that all these backgrounds, when you look at the various dependencies of the fields, of the type 2 fields on this circle, the dependence is not strange, it's not wild. It's a very systematic dependence. And in particular, the dependence is totally encoded in this matrix A that is an SL2 element. Okay, so it depends on this coordinate eta, as you can see here. And what it is interesting is that those type 2B fields, <coughs> which are uh, charged under the SL2 of the type 2B supergravity, all those fields will pick up a dependence of this eta coordinate, and the rest of the fields, which are not uh, transforming under the SL2 of type 2B, for example, the metric, will in principle not pick up any dependence on this coordinate. For example, the same will happen with the Ramon Ramon 4 form the C4, it is SL2 singlet, so it will not pick up any dependence on this eta. So then since everything boils down to this uh, eta dependence in the form of an SL2 related uh, business, it will be useful to use the SL2 covariant formulation of type 2. So for example, I will be all the time talking about the D2 and the C2 fields as a doublet of SL2, 
which is this fancy uh, B letter here. And there will be this alpha index, which is the SL2 index. That will be the first component and the second component. That is interesting. And in the same way, I will put together the axiom C0 of type 2B and the dilaton phi of type 2B, and I will ensemble them into the usual SL2 matrix M alpha beta, such that when I think of the SL2 action, it will are always linear on these fields. On the B alpha, it will act linearly, and also on the M alpha beta. It will be useful to have this type 2B compact uh, description of type 2B in order to, to describe this S. So what it is interesting, as I said, is that these s holes can always be understood as first performing a dimensional reduction from 10 to 5. And once you are in 5, you perform an additional reduction over this circle S1. And what it is interesting is that the fields will pick up a dependence on this eta coordinate only through this S2 matrix A. And what it is even more interesting is that if you evaluate whether this matrix induces a monodromy, which means the following, take the matrix, evaluate it at a certain point eta, take again the metric, evaluate it at eta plus t, t in the period of the S1, and compute A inverse A. If there is no monodromy, this gives you the identity, because you go, in a sense, you trigger what you do when you go around. But if you compute explicitly this quantity, you get that there is a non-trivial monodromy precisely classified by this matrix, uh, math frac M that I'm writing here. So the solution is what is called in type 2B language a non-geometric solution because it's locally well-defined, but when you go globally, you have to glue together the different fields of type 2B, in particular, the ones that are charged under the SL2. You have to glue them when you go around the S1 with a non-trivial SL2 monodromy, which is the one I showed. And this is called a non-geometric background of type 2B string theory that is always locally is correct, but only when you go globally around the S1, you start seeing these fancy things. What it is also interesting is that if I do the dimensional reduction from 5D to 4D, then what I get is an effective four-dimensional description of all this uh, setup. And this four-dimensional effective description, it goes in the form of a very specific supergravity with the maximal amount of supersymmetries called a maximal supergravity, and with one specific gauge symmetry, which is this gauge group here. So in the end, the different factors in the gauge group, this is called a gauge in supergravity, the different factors, they just come from the higher dimensional things you are, there, you are doing. For example, the SO6 factor in the gauge group comes from the five sphere, and the SO11 factor in the gauge group comes precisely by this, uh, the origin is precisely this A matrix, which is an element of SO2, and in particular is in the hyperbolic class, is what you would call an SO11 element inside the cell. Okay? So this is the geometric description of this type to be S holes from a 10 dimensional perspective. I'll change. Yeah, it try again. So then, for example, let me show you the simplest test for you can, you can do. The simplest one <laughs> is the solution I display here. So you can see that the metric has the ADS for piece, the eta coordinate, which is the S1, and then the five sphere, which is round. And beautiful. It's just the most symmetric Pfeiffer sphere you can think of. And therefore, you can see that this S fold will feature an SO6 symmetry precisely because the sphere is round and it's not deformed. When you look at the F5, the F5 is very simple. It's just threading, uh, let's say there is it's a Freund Rubin type uh, solution. It's just threading the, 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 the internal and the external pieces. And then when you look at the B field and the C2, let's say the B2 and the C2, as I said before, they will be just, or let's say the, the, the profile they will get will be just the SL2 rotated version of some eta independent quantity that is the math frac beta, B, sorry. So the math frac B would be an eta independent B2 and C2. And then you just rotate it with the A matrix in order to introduce the eta dependence through this SL2 twist. And in particular for the simplest uh, S fold is zero because the math frac Bs are zero. So when you rotate zeros, you get zeros. And then when you look at the action dilaton, you see that indeed there is an eta dependence that is fully encoded in the A matrix, so it's acting linearly on this math frac M, which is eta independent, and in particular is just the identity matrix. Okay, so this is like the simplest uh, S-fold you can build. It is non-supersymmetric. This is something you can check. And then it has this SO6 symmetry coming precisely from the five sphere that is found. And as you see, the structure is always the one that it must be. 
So your B2 and C2 are nothing but the SL2 rotated version of some eta independent ones, in this case zero. And the action dilaton is just the SL2 rotated version of some eta independent action dilaton, which is the math fraction. And this will be the pattern in any other solution. So you can go to a more complicated solution, which is an S-fold that preserves SU3 symmetry but and it also what enjoys the what is T here. Sorry? You have A to the minus, minus T. What is T? What is T? In the M. Ah, inverse transpose. Ah. Inverse transpose. Okay. Yeah, it's because I define I define the A as the one acting <laughs> on an object with the SL2 index up. Yeah. And therefore, when the guy has the indices down, you have to act with the inverse from the other side or the inverse transpose uh, from the left. It's just uh, the way SL2 is acting. Okay. So there is this other solution, which is the, the solution that preserves n equals to one, and it has SU3 symmetry. And again, you can see the ADS4 piece here, the eta coordinate along the S1. And now you see that the S5 is distorted such that only the piece that is CP2, a CP2 piece inside it, is left uh, undeformed. And therefore, because of the CP2, you get an SU3 symmetry of your solution because SU3 is the symmetry group of CP2. And then in particular, you also get the standard U1 vibration of uh, uh, the five sphere when you see it as CP2 fiber over an additional set. So that from the geometry here, you would say that the symmetry is not SU3, but SU3 plus U1, because you would have isometries on this fiber. But then when you look at the other fields, you observe that the V2 and the C2 are related to the two forms in CP2, which are charged under the U1. So is this the presence of the V2 and the C2 field? Feels, sorry, precisely what breaks this uh, U1C. So again, you see that the F5 is a, so it's a very simple form. The V2 and the C2, they are the SL2 transformation of certain math frag bees, and the math frag bees are the pieces you see here. And the same for the action dilaton. All the dependence on the eta coordinates always come from the A twist. And then is twisting something that is eta independent, this time again, the identity matrix. Okay? It's always the same structure in all the solutions. So you can keep on going. And then you can find more complicated solutions. For example, there is a more fancy solution that preserves n equals to two. And then it has a symmetry, which is SU2 cross U1. And again, you can see that, for example, in this time, the 10 dimensional geometry is the ADS4 factor, factor. Then there is the eta coordinate. Then there is an S2 spanned by theta and phi. And then there is an S3 that you express in terms of SU2 left invariant forms, which are given by sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3. So then you can see that the symmetries of this solution is SU2, of course, because you are using SU2 invariant forms. But then you also gain an additional new one, which is precisely the one that rotates sigma 1 and sigma 3. And this will be identified with the U1 R symmetry in the field theory, because in field theory, whenever you have an n equals to two, I will come back to this, we will see that this uh, n equals to two field theories will have an SO2, which is U1 R symmetry, and geometrically is precisely that U1, the one that rotates sigma one and sigma three. Then the background for F5 is complicated, but eta independent because F5 has no charge under SO2. And then you can see as usual that B2 and C2 are nothing but the SL2 rotated version of some eta independent math frag, which are this V1 and this V2 that I display here. And then similarly, the SL2 action dilaton is nothing but the SL2 rotated version of the eta independent one, which is, which is the math frag that this time is a bit more complicated because it depends on coordinates theta and phi on this S2 over here. The solution is more complicated, but <coughs> There's nothing, let's say, special about them apart from being more complicated. So, are you going to explain how you got these solutions? Or? I will. I will explain. And why are they called S folds? Because of the because the because the folding because, because the multi-value thing based on the SL two S duality. Mm -hmm. Because this SL two is the S duality symmetry global symmetry of type two B, and then essentially what you do is you right. you glue with these uh, transition functions. Uh, which are these S-duality elements, and then you call it an S-fold. Mm -hmm. It's like when you glue with T-dualities and you call it T-fold, yeah. now you glue with S-dualities and you call it S-fold. Mm -hmm. I, I have another question, sorry, Adolfo. And uh, how crucial it is that uh, you always have an, an ADS-4 factor? Can't you generalize this uh, trick of, uh, of S-fold to more generic? Yeah, um, yeah, 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 because actually you have the SL2 factor, sorry, the, the, this SL2 uh, twist somehow, and then when you play with this SL2 twist, 
essentially what you do is you generate, let's say there is always a four dimensional effective description of the entire theory in terms of this supergravity here. Even if you find a black hole in this supergravity when you uplift, the whole SL2 business will be there. If you find any other solution, not AGS4, but domain walls, black holes, a Janus solution, any kind of solution that you find in this four dimensional effective supergravity, when you uplift it, the whole dependence on the eta coordinate will go through this SL2 thing. So there's nothing special about ADS4. It's just about the- but Does it have to be four-dimensional? Sorry, do you, you have, do you have to be a four-dimensional factor? Yeah, I will tell you why later on. Yes, okay. I must be in four dimensions. Thank but you. But in principle, you could even, I must be in four dimensions for this game that I'm explaining today. But in general, I will show you later on whether the only crucial thing is that you have some circle, but I'll come back to this later because at this point, it uh, sounds a bit strange, but it will become, more clear later, I guess. Okay, thank you. If you combine with T duality, it will change the dimensionality. You could do that, for example. And then there is also this uh, fancy S fold, that is the one I will focus uh, in this talk, which is N equals to four, so it's very supersymmetric, and it features this SO4 symmetry. And then when you look at it, the structure is once again the same, so you get the ADS4 piece, the eta coordinate, and then the five sphere is this time view as an interval parameterized by this coordinate alpha from zero to pi half. The interval times an S2, times an S2. So then the entire symmetry of this S4, which is this SO4 group, is nothing but the SU2, SU2 you get from each of the, of the two spheres. And this is gonna be an R symmetry group in a field theory that I will discuss later on, but you see how geometrically this is realized. Then you see that the S5 is very simple, and then you get, as usual, that the V2 and the C2 are, again, the SL2 twisted version of the math frac quantities. And the math frac quantities are eta independent. And in particular, one of them is threading the first two sphere, the other is threading the other two sphere. And then you also get the type 2B axon dilaton, which is, again, the SL2 twisted version of the math frac one. And the math frac one is eta independent, and in particular, only depends on the coordinate alpha of this integral. So you see that the geometry is, uh, is very simple. And it is important to highlight that whenever you have a solution, for example, all these ideas for aqua, you could ask yourself, what if I switch off the twist? Should I still retain the solution, which is along the questions that you were making? And the answer is no. These solutions are not a twist deformation version of an untwisted one. They are genuinely twisted. If there is no twist, there is no ideas for vacuum. So you definitely need the twist to be on for the ADS for vacuum to appear. This is an important thing. Okay. Is it something that you can see explicitly? Yeah, because for example, when I compute the scalar potential of this effective supergravity, the one here, there will be one parameter here, I will show you later. There will be one parameter here that is essentially associated to having or not having the twist. And when you have this parameter off, the scalar potential has no minima, not even a single one. There's no extreme of the scalar potential. And when the parameter is on, then you generate a plethora of ADS for vacua in the effective supergravity, which is the ones, which are the ones sorry, that I'm discussing now in 10 dimensions. Yeah, but, but suppose you, you send this capital T to zero. You have the, the previous transparency. Yeah. The monodromy. Yeah. You have the, it depends on capital T. Right? Yeah, it depends on the capital T. Exactly. It can be sent to zero. But it then it's pathological because then you collapse the. the, collapse, the yeah. yeah. Actually. Or to infinity. To infinity, yes. And then you decompactify this, and I will come back in the end, you see the different solution, but I will come back to that. So this is the discussion of these S-folds from uh, 10 dimensions, but you can try to, to, to think of whether these S-folds will be like more general than what I show here, right? Because here it shows solutions with a lot of symmetries, a lot of supersymmetries, so you can wonder, is it possible to, to have like the formations of these S-folds? And then there is this uh, interesting observation, and there was something that we like when we realized it, that people had discussed in the literature as false as a limiting case of Janus solutions. Janus solutions are solutions in type 2B in which the dilaton changes from one value on one side of the, what is called a defect, to an interface, 
to some other value in the other side. Right? And people have already understood that these S-faults could be viewed as unlimiting uh, cases of Janus in which the jump occurs sort of like an instantaneous, you know, very localized change. Right? So it was interesting this observation by these people that S-faults could be, as I said, obtained as limiting Janus solutions. And this is interesting because Janus solutions are known in ABS-EFT to be dual to interfaces of super jam mills, in which you have a defect in super jam mills, which is three-dimensional defect in n equals four super jam mills. And then on one side of the defect, the gauge coupling is, uh, takes some value. And in the other side of the defect, another value. And then there is a running of the gauge coupling from one side to the other. And it was also very interesting that all these interfaces of super jam mills were classified systematically in a field theory paper by this paper here. So all the supersymmetric interfaces of super jam mills were classified in a field theory paper. And what is interesting is that the classification of supersymmetric ones matches exactly the s faults the symmetries of the s faults that we found. So there was an interface with uh, n equals to one and SU3, another one with n equals to two and SU2 cross U1, and another one with n equals to four and SO4. And these were precisely the symmetry groups of the type 2B s faults that we found. But then when you go to this paper and you read it more carefully, there is this interesting note where they say that these interfaces are the largest symmetric cases, but one could always construct less symmetric ones by deforming these interfaces by adding certain supersymmetric BPS operators that in the end they could break whatever flavor symmetries you have, for example. For this interface is an n equals to one field theory in three dimensions, so there's no R symmetry, continuous R symmetry, and then the entire SU3 symmetry is flavored. And then they discuss that by turning on BPS operators, you could break SU3 to some smaller flavor group, either SU2 plus U1 or U1 squared, which is the maximal cardinal. And the same for this one. This one is an n equals to two field theory in three dimensions, so this one is the R symmetry factor, but then this SU2 is flavored. And they in principle, you could think of deforming this interface and then breaking the SU2, for example, down to U1, which is the best. Okay. And for this other one, it could be, according to this paper, not possible because the entire thing is R symmetry and there's no flavor symmetry in this interface. Okay. So then we were puzzled by this and then we thought, ah, so we would like to find these deformations in the gravity side and try to construct more general s faults than these ones in which all these flavor symmetries have been broken. And then if you want to study the formations of a solution in 10 dimensions, if you are smart enough, you can try to find the deformations already in 10D. If you are not so smart, then you try to go to some uh, more manageable or tractable setup. And in particular, we decided to work in the four dimensional effective description in terms of a four dimensional supergravity of all these s -folds. Because s -folds in 10 dimensions are complicated solutions you obtain by solving uh, differential equations and so on. Whereas from a four dimensional perspective, they are extremely simple solutions because they are ADS for vacua of a given supergravity. So in the end, it's just extremizing a scalar potential is an algebraic problem that you can handle much easier. So then we decided to find ADS for vacua in that specific gauge supergravity to see whether we find classes of solutions depending on parameters, which could be the duals of all these PPS operators that they discuss in the interface uh, context. So this is what we did. So we focus on this gauge supergravity. It's one supergravity, so you can construct it from the beginning till the end, the Lagrangian equations of motion, and so on. So you construct it. It is an n equals to eight supergravity. So you know what is the field content. It's just the supergravity multiplet. So the metric, which is the spin two, the eight gravitini, which are spin three half, twenty eight vector fields, which are precisely the vector fields uh, spanning the gauge group. The gauge group, keep in mind, is twenty eight dimensional. So you get one generator here. 15 here and 12 there, so they add up to 28, and you have 28 vector fields in your theory. Then you get uh, 56 spin one half fields, which are the dilatini and the supergravity multiplet, and the 70 scalars, which are like the field content, the scalar, the spinless field content of maximal supergravity. That you know, if you know a bit of supergravity, that these scalar fields they have kinetic terms, which are very specific ones, and are precisely the ones associated to this corset space structure of the scalar manifold, and in particular. For four dimensional supergravity, the coset space is this E7 over SU8. It's rigid, is one. So then 
Now you are in a four dimensional realm, so you can ask four dimensional questions. And the first four <laughs> question that you ask is whether there is just one way of building this gauge group, or there are like different inequivalent ways of gauging the same gauge symmetry in your, in your supergravity, in your 4D supergravity. And then there is a definite answer to this question, and the answer is yes. There is a one parameter family, a one parameter. You have the you have one parameter, let's say, that you can play with, and it gives you inequivalent ways of gauging the same gauge group. So the gauge group is always the same. It's just the embedding you make on this is seven sp fifty six, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, is different. And then essentially you say, yeah, that's very good, but what does it mean precisely? And what it precisely means is that in four dimensions, and this is the subtlety about four dimensions. In four dimensions, vector fields are dual to vector fields upon four dimensional host duality. This does not happen in any other dimension. But in 4D, vectors are dual to vectors. And therefore, for each vector that you would call electric vector, physical vector, there is another one that is the host dual of it and is the magnetic vector. And then you can wonder, you may wonder whether you are forced to connect in your gauge uh, covariant derivative only electric vectors, or in principle, you could go freely and connect a linear combination of electric and magnetic vectors. Because you are in 4D, and in 4D, you can try to see whether you can do this. Then you study it in detail, and then you observe, you notice, you conclude that it is possible to gauge this gauge group with a linear combination of electric and magnetic vectors. And this specific combination is encoded in one parameter that you call it C. So when C is equal to zero, <coughs> the gauging is purely electric and only electric vectors enter in the covariant derivative. And when the parameter C is on, then you gauge the gauge group with a linear combination of electric and magnetic vectors. And that specific linear combination is the one entering the covariant derivative, the gauge connection. Okay. So then you play a little bit more in four dimensions and then you notice, you realize that this parameter is an on off deformation in the sense of when it is zero, it is zero. But when it is different from zero, you can always make rescalings in your theory such that you bring it to any desirable value, let's say one. So in the end, this deformation is not a continuous deformation. It's an on-off deformation parameter. It's like a Roma's mass in type 2 supergravity in 10D that you can always rescale it to any value uh, you like if it is not zero. So this is the same story here. So this is just duality at the level of four dimensional fields. Exactly. Exactly. It's really related to that. So there is one scalar field somehow that is charged under this thing. So whenever this parameter is on, you can play with the scalar field to bring it to, to one. And it will be a field redefinition bringing you the coefficient to any value. And then you fix it to one. So in the end, you get two inequivalent classes of this specific gauge of gravity. The case in which the gauge is purely electric that will connect to the case in which you don't do any SL2 twist. And the SL2 twist that I was talking about is A matrix that you see in 10 dimensions and so on is just the identity. And then you get the other case, which is when the parameter is not zero. And in this case, the twist matrix is, it will be precisely the one that I showed you before. So in the end, you see that there are two possible ways of uh, gauging this theory. And in particular, they will always connect to having an SL2 twist, in one case, the trivial one, and in the other case, the one that I mentioned before, okay? So then, as I said, I mean, the scalars in four-dimensional supergravity, they are many, there are 70 to be precise. So you don't work with 70 scalar fields. You don't try to extremize a scalar potential depending on 70 fields, it's just too much. So just go, what we did was to go to a simpler, but large enough class of uh, restricted models in which you switch off the vectors, you switch off most of the scalars, and you end up in a very simple setup. That is a consistent truncation because it's based on retaining fields which are singlets under certain parity transformations, some reflection symmetries. So you turn off most of the fields, but in a consistent way, you don't do it crazy. Okay. So then we went for a very simple model, which is in the end describing a subsector of the entire theory, but it's a consistent subsector. And this subsector in the end just contains seven complex fields. It's much easier than 70 real fields. Right? So you just go with seven complex fields, and in particular, that subsector itself corresponds to a n equals to one supersymmetric subsector of the entire n equals to eight theory. So it's a supersymmetric sector of the theory that you will look at. So as any n equals to one 
theory, it will be described by a scalar potential, described in the kinetic terms of the complex scalar fields that I call them set type, and then some superpotential that tells you the interactions between the different uh, uh, complex fields. And then you see that whenever the parameter is on, this C parameter is on, and then you gauge the gauge group also involving magnetic vectors, which is called ionic gauging, then you get this new piece of the scalar potential, of the superpotential in this case, that you wouldn't get when the parameter C is zero. And without this piece, this for the theory does not have a single ADS for value. And with this piece, this four dimensional theory generates a lot of ADS for value. Actually, now people have studied them systematically, and I think there are more than 200 or something like that. So, really, quite a lot just by turning on this apparently innocent perturbation, the C parameter. So, then you go, you sit, and then you extremize the scalar potential and what you get is that you get ADS for vacua, and in particular, you get what you expect to get. So you get a vacuum that is n equals to zero on SO6, which was the case of the first s fold, a vacuum that is n equals to one on SU3, whose uplift would be the second s fold, the same for this one, and then you get an ADS for uh, n equals to four on SO4 vacuum, whose uplift would be the last s fold that I showed you. But then <laughs> what it comes as a surprise, maybe not that much, that's why we were searching for, is that the location of all these vacua in field space normally allows for free parameters. And in particular, the free parameters would be the real part of certain fields, what is what we call actions. Because in our parametrization, the real part is what you call the axionic part, and the imaginary part is what you call the dilatonic part. And then we use this upper half plane parametrization of these complex fields, so in the end, the imaginary part must be positive, and so on. But the thing is that these families, this vacua, they will be just the largest symmetric representative of a larger class or a larger family of aqua. For example, I told you before that there was this s fold which was n equals to one and SU3. But then when you rediscover that s fold from a four-dimensional perspective, you find that in the end, there is a multi-parametric family of such a specific vacuum. Because there are three parameters, which are these three actions, chi one, two, three, the real part of these three complex fields, which are not fixed. They are flat directions of the scalar potential. They are, they are really, what you could say, free parameters in your, in your ADS for vacua. So your ADS for vacua with SU3 symmetry comes into a three parameter family. Actually, it's a two parameter family because you find that this constraint must hold. So the sum of the three must be zero. So then, what is surprising is firstly that when you compute the vacuum energy, the radius of ADS4, of all this, uh, of this family, it happens that the vacuum energy is independent of the deformation parameters. So they are flat directions in the scalar potential and holographically they are marginal operators in the dual CFT3s that I will discuss a bit in the end. So they do not affect the scalar potential, so they are flat deformations. Sometimes we call them action-like deformations because they come in the form of an action in a complex field. Sometimes we call them flat deformations because they don't change the scalar potential, and sometimes we combine and call them action-like flood deformation, but it's all the time the same. Yeah? And what it came as a surprise, and this really came as a surprise to us, is that when you compute the scalars, the masses of the 70 scalars in the full theory, these masses depend on the chi parameters. So whenever you start playing with the chi's, you are changing the masses. And if you change the masses of the scalar fields, you change the conformal dimensions of the dual operators. So in the end, what it happens is that you have marginal deformations in the field theory that change the conformal dimension of the corresponding operators. Okay. But what it was interesting is that for any value of these parameters, you never break supersymmetries. And this is linked to the fact that there was no supersymmetry to be broken. It's just the breaking of the SU3 flavor symmetry in the field theory, what you will get by playing with these chi parameters. Okay. So for example, you see that when the three parameters are zero, I get SU3 symmetry, and then the very symmetric S fold that I showed you at the beginning with the CP2 factor and so on. But then when I start playing with the chi's, for example, when I turn on one, I break SU3 to SU2 cross U1. And when you turn on the two of them, because there are two independent ones, because the sum of the three is zero, when you turn on the second one, then you fully break also this SU2 to just the U1 square Cartan flavor group of SU3, flavor subgroup of SU3. So you have a sequential flavor symmetry breaking by playing with these actions, but you never change the cosmological constants, so they are always marginal operators. Okay. 
Yeah. So the, the, the contribution of the guys to the mass is always positive. And so could it be that the, you know, the chi i is and chi i is very large could be negative or actually you know? in this case it cannot happen because the entire family is supersymmetric. So okay. you can never trigger an instability in this way. You could change the values, you could go negative, but always up to the BF bound. Okay. Which is the minus nine over four in four dimensions theory. Below that, you could generate an instability, and this cannot happen because this entire family is always supersymmetric. So it's protected from uh, perturbative uh, instabilities. So one thing I, I thought that at least the supersymmetric ADS for backgrounds were all classified. But also, were classified by this uh, Martelli uh, well, many years. Uh, so is that uh, fitting but, this? But you mean, you mean a full classification of ADS for backward well, in you, type you, 2B? Using these GS, GS, GS structures and things like that. But in 4D, no. No, ADS. For 4D, but well, Neil is the expert on this. I think you're thinking of ADS by ink. If you're Martelli and Gold, that they wrote one on ADS 5 in 2D, I think it was one. In 4D, well, ADS 5 for sure, but I thought also, uh, I mean, ADS 4. Well, I mean, there's a classification in terms of G structures yeah. that are uh, promise yellow, the rest of them did, but I mean, it's very close range. So, I mean, it's in Yeah, no, it's not, it's not exhaustive in that, in that sense. So, I have another question about action. I mean, so, you are, you are saying that this field theory should correspond to, to this um, uh, theories with a defect, right? So, what is creating the defect? That's... Ah, but this is different because. This is a this is a this is a very from the point of view, not, not from the no, no. theory point of view, but from, from the point of view of supergravity. What is create? Is that the sevens or for that you should know? I mean, this is something really I wanted to discuss a bit later, but I mean from the from the gravity from the supergravity point of uh, of view, yes. you would like to know what is the brain setup underlying this uh, yeah. S4 backgrounds. And you don't know for any of them, not even for the N equals to four and so forth. So the brain setup description of all these objects, it will come, uh, I mean, it's, it's an open question. Then what I will discuss a little bit in the end is that you can be all these field theories, all these field theories that I'm talking about, these s CFTs, let's say, they can be viewed as the IR limit of super jam in four dimensions. And what you have to do in super jam in four dimensions to, to, to create this is to turn it on some anisotropy, because in the end, the whole story here is because of the SL2 twist along the eta direction. And the eta direction will be a boundary space-like direction. So you have to turn on something non-trivial there, for example, Wilson lines on the gauge fields, and that will trigger the flow to this point. There was this, uh, I remember there was some paper by Guy Yoto and Whitten. Huh? Yeah, Classifying, uh, actually, and they fit, they fit very well for these TSUM theories and so on. That fit very well for the, for the N equals to four, well, for this S4, sorry. Okay. Okay, well, this one will fit very well. And actually there was a proposal by Tomasiello and Benjamin Assel saying that this is the IR limit of the TSUN theory of Gajoto Witten when you gauge the UN diagonal flavor group using an N equals to four vector multiplet. They propose that, then they compute the free energy of, of what would be that, and then they match precisely the scalar potential of these ideas for that. So for this case, there has been this proposal. For the marginal deformations thereof that I didn't show yet, but I will come back to this, it's an open question. We made a proposal, but it's, a, it's not yet placed. So the thing is that, as I said, by playing with these actions, you break the symmetry from SU3 to SU2 to SU1 or to U1 squared. And since these are related to flavor symmetries in the field theory, because the field theory is n equals to one, so there is no R symmetry, continuous R symmetry. In the end, this is all flavor symmetry breaking triggered by this action deformations. And then you can think yourself, what if I try to play the same game with the n equals to four and SO4? I could wonder whether there are two deformations, chi one and chi two, breaking the original <laughs> SO4 to either uh, SU2 cross U1 or U1 squared again, breaking to the Cartan. Right? And then you go and check and you construct it explicitly and you find that indeed there is a two parameter family. I call again the two parameters chi one and chi two. And then when these two parameters are zero, you are at the wonderful n equals to four and SO4 uh, ADS for vacuum with the dual S fold that I described before. But now what it is interesting is that this SO4 factor is purely asymmetry from a field theory perspective. So when turning on the actions, 
I will break SO4 into SU2 plus U1. And if I further turn the other one, because this is just by turning one or turning the two of them simultaneously, you break completely to the U1 squared. And in all these cases, what you are doing by turning these actions is nothing but breaking supersymmetries in what could be the field theory. So you would start from this n equals to four, three-dimensional superconformal field theory. You would break by turning on one of the actions. You could break the symmetries to an n equals to two. So this is the u one symmetry with a C2 flavor. Or you would further break to n equals to zero and u one plus u one fully flavor symmetries. So you see that at some point, the distinction in the literature between flavor and R symmetries is a little bit artificial because you could really handle the two at the same time and they will happen to be R symmetry or flavor symmetry in a case by case story. But overall, they are of the same nature, let's say like this. Right? So what came as a very interesting thing again is that by turning on these two parameters, you never affect, you never change the cosmological constant. So again, marginal deformations. You compute the masses of the 70 scalar fields, they depend on the chi's. And now, surprisingly, as Alfonso was pointing out, now there is no supersymmetry. So you might wonder whether you violate the BF bound whenever you push these chi's to whatever large value or something. And then you go, you check yourself, and no, the answer is no. You can never go below the BF uh, bound for this two parameter family of uh, ADS for vacua, which are non supersymmetric. And then you double check that it is not supersymmetric because you compute the gravity no masses and you find indeed that they are sensitive to, to the chi deformations. And only when the two chi's are zero, you get that the masses are one in units of ADS4. So you have supersymmetry and so on. But when you turn on the chi's, you start breaking supersymmetries. But still, still, sorry, at the four dimensional supergravity level, you don't see any instability. You never violate the BF bound for any of the scalar fields. So this implies that at least in the 4D, Description, these non-supersymmetric vacua are stable, perturbatively stable. It could happen that then higher up in the KK tower of states, you might run into some state in the KK tower uh, with a mass below the BF bound, and then you get an instability in higher dimensions. But in lower dimensions, there is no instability, okay? even though the vacuum is non-supersymmetric. So this is a very controlled manner of breaking supersymmetries, just by playing with these actions. What felt uh, n equals one and n equals three? I mean, I understand that you're not really looking at this from looking for this from the perspective of these uh, interfaces, but I mean, a more natural breaking would be uh, down to an SO3, sorry. An SO? An SO3, the diagonal SO3 of SO4, right? And then you get but, a three plus one split. Um, so did you check that? Or? I think I didn't get the question, sorry. A more, if you're starting out with an SO4, R-symmetry, a more natural breaking is down to the SO3 subgroup. You get the 3 plus 1, so you get an n equals 3 part and an n equals 1 part. Right? Ah, I see. So you say if you try to make a breaking from SO4 to SO3, so you go through an n equals to 3. We have checked that, and but it's a paper we are finishing now, but it's not included in this talk. <coughs> but you can do it as well. So you can break n equals four to n equals three as well with a different embedding, as you're saying. But you need additional ingredients that are too technical to discuss here. But we can, I, I can, I can show you later. On. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I was not understanding. So now that we have understood the six, the existence, sorry, of these uh, flat deformations in four dimensions, dual to marginal operators in principle in a three-dimensional field theory, we want to understand them better. Like, what are these things in ten dimensions and Try to understand them as I said, like that, a little bit better. So, how much time do I have? Um, well, it's only like 15 minutes. 15 minutes, okay. I have to, you know, we have to speed up a little bit. So, the thing is, what we did was the following. So, we took the most symmetric solution, which was the SO6, even though it was uh, non supersymmetric, but the SO6, where the sphere was round. And just to start getting a, a feeling of what is going on, we noticed that when you turn on the actions, what you do is the following. You do a geometric thing. It's nothing to do with the SL2 twist that I was talking before for the type to be fields. It's nothing to do with that. I will call that the duality twist, the S duality twist, twist, sorry. And that is okay, that will be there all the time. But now when you turn on the action sky, you do something else. And what you do is you introduce a non-trivial vibration on your internal geometry. So in particular, you fiber the five sphere over the S1 with the eta coordinate. This is what you do. It's nothing to do with duality. It has to do 
nothing to do with this duality. It has to do with a geometrical thing that you're doing. So for example, you can view your actions in the following almost trivial manner, but it's far from being trivial. We thought it was trivial at the beginning, but it's far from being trivial. Take your favorite five sphere metric, which is the round one. And then you know that this uh, metric has SO6 symmetry, that you write it in this coordinate so that you only make manifest the three commuting uh, isometries, the cartons of SO6. So you essentially, you see here, these three coordinates, bar phi one, bar phi two, and bar phi three, which are the three angles associated to the three U1s inside SO6, the three carton, the maximally commuting set of isometries of the five sphere. And the only thing that you do when you turn on the actions, which is almost trivial the first time you look at it, is you just take, by turning on the actions, the only thing that you do is what you could call a change of coordinates. So essentially, the only thing that you do is you take these original coordinates and you connect them through these actions chi to the eta coordinate of the S1. So from a 10-dimensional perspective, you could say, well, you're cheating. This is just a change of coordinates. Of course, if I start with a solution with chi equals zero, I can generate another solution with chi different from zero because this is just a change of coordinates. But it's not true because it's true at the local level, but it's not at the global level because you change the periodicities. And only when these chi's, you take them to be zeros or multiples of two pi over t, then is when it is really globally well-defined. And then you can check that the entire uh, physical properties of the vacuum are the same. But when you take values of the chi's which are different from two pi over t multiples, multiples of two pi over t, you are doing something locally trivial, but globally non-trivial. And the physics feels that, that's the whole point. So then you understand this a bit better by noticing that whenever you turn on your three chi's associated to the three cartons of SO6, the only thing that you are doing in the end is inducing a monodromy that you can call it like this, H1, H2, H3, each of these being induced by one of the guys. And the whole story has to do with what is this monodromy doing? So this is a monodromy that when you go around the S1, you do something on the S5, it's something geometrical. So you map points up to this monodromy on the S5 when you go around the S1. And then by choosing different patterns of this H monodromy by turning on the three actions or by turning on two or by turning on one or by turning on none, you cause the different patterns of symmetry breaking that uh, you saw at the four dimensional level. So from a higher dimensional perspective, this is what you are doing. You are globally breaking the symmetries of S5. And what it is interesting is that by playing with the actions <coughs> and choosing different uh, elements in this monodromy, you recover, you reconstruct, you reproduce exactly all the symmetries uh, of uh, all the patterns of symmetry breaking that we discussed before. And then there was the natural question of how do I see that chi going to chi plus two pi over t is periodic? Because I don't see it at the level of the 4D spectrum. Because if I look at the masses that I showed you before, you replace chi and by two pi and you, you don't get periodicity of this. And then these people check explicitly that you get this periodicity in the full KK tower. And what happens is that certain field that was in the four dimensional effective supergravity goes up, it's not periodic, but somebody else that was massive because it was in this particular case uh, at level two in the KK tower goes down and takes over the position of the guy that went up. So you restore periodicity at the level of the full spectrum, not at the level of the 4D spectrum. So you need to check and that essentially like the entire KK tower to, to conclude that indeed it must be the case. But from the higher dimensional perspective, we saw that it must be the case because when you shift like this, the monodromy gets trivialized. When you shift by this specific multiple of two pi over t, monodromies is, uh, is the same. They, they, they become trivial monodromies. So it must go back to itself. And this is what these people check with all these KK spectrography, uh, techniques that have been developed now in the exceptional context, they check the geometry. So in the end, what you get is what uh, we discovered that is called in mathematics, the mapping torus, which is something. The mapping torus is sort of, it's not a geometry, it's a whole class, uh, equivalence class of geometries. So essentially, whenever you have a manifold N, in this case, the S5, times an interval, which is in this case, the S1, the eta coordinate, you can always define what is called the mapping torus. And the mapping torus is that you identify on the S5 points 
which are connected by an element H in the monodromy. And you have to identify them when eta, let's say the interval is at the origin and when you get the other endpoint. So in the end, what you get in a pictorial manner is that you get a point here in, in, in the geometry at eta equals zero. And when you get to eta equals t, which is going around the S1, this point has moved. And now it's some other point in the S5. And in particular, it's connected to the original one by the monodromy H. And you must identify these two points. And this is what we call the mapping torus in mathematics. So in the end, the picture that you get at the end of the day is that when you are in four dimensions and you have a vacuum without actions, something you can do is, this is what we did, we uplift it using exceptional field theory. This is the way we did, Alfonso, because when you do exceptional field theory, you don't have to guess how it looks in higher dimensions. It's just a generalized shell construct reduction. There is a fixed prescription. You just crank it and you get it. So we found the vacuum in four dimensions. We do the entire exceptional field theory uplift, which was uh, tedious, but there is nothing to guess. You sit down, you work it out, and then you get your type to be backgrounds. But then once you are in 10 dimensions for the antiform solutions, you can do the local change of coordinates that I mentioned before. And then you get a new solution where the internal geometry is this mapping torus. And then this mapping torus, this solution, this deformed solution can be obtained, let's say from the four dimensional solution with actions by doing this exceptional field theory machinery. So this coset has no fixed point, so you don't have to worry for this. No, 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 that's, it. that's an important thing. So we were still puzzled, I said like, okay, now we understand it geometrically from 10 dimensions, but why is not affecting uh, the vacuum energy? Like why is it a flat direction? We really wanted to know why was this a flat direction? Why when you turn on the skies, you don't change the cosmological constant? Geometrically in higher dimensions, now we understood it's okay, but why this was a flat direction? This is something that was puzzling us for six months. And the ultimate reason is the following. We have a very specific theory, which is this uh, gauge of gravity that I told you before. And this is depicted by this blue spot here. And then we discovered, as uh, we have been discussing, that you could have different areas for vacua when these skies are different from zero. So given this theory in the blue spot, you have one vacuum here, another vacuum there, and another vacuum there. But then we realized that since you are in these maximal supergravities, there is a formal E7 invariance that you can play with all the time. Because scalar fields, they span coset spaces. Coset spaces are homogeneous spaces. And any two points in an homogeneous space can be connected by a transformation, in this case of E7. So even if you get a vacuum somewhere there with all the chi's activated, you can always bring it to, let's call it the origin, where the chi's are zero, by acting with a non-compact E7 transformation. But since the entire theory, Lagrangian couplings, et cetera, it has this E7 invariance, if you perform a transformation to bring a solution from there to here, you are forced to perform the same transformation at the level of the couplings in the Lagrangian, because formally, they are encoded in something that is called the embedding tensor. And the embedding tensor that encodes, as I said, all the couplings in the theory, it lives in a new rep of E7, and it's not a single. So whenever you play this trick of bringing your scalar fields to the origin to get rid of the actions, you have to act with the same transformation on the embedding tensor, namely on the couplings of the theory. So you change the theory by doing this trick. So what we saw was to exchange, to trade, let's say, the action deformation at the level of one theory and different vacua by let's bring all these actions to zero. So all the solutions are brought to the origin of field space, but then you create different theories. If you just play with chi one, you move just uh, to the theta one tilde theory or to the theta two theory with chi two or to the theta three theory with chi three. So in the end, what we notice is that the new theories that we obtain were the original ones that I've been talking about all the time plus a new piece. And the new piece was precisely encoded in this chi one, chi two, and chi three. And when you look at this piece alone by itself, you discover that these couplings in the Lagrangian are nothing but something that was known from the 70s, which is called the kremer shirkham flat theories, which are theories with non-trivial couplings in the Lagrangian, but with an exactly zero scalar potential. And that's why we realized, this is the way we realized that by turning on the actions, we could trade the questions we were asking ourselves to just what are we doing at the level of changing the theory? And we are just changing the original theory 
by the original one with a deformation, which is precisely of the form of a flat Kremer second thrust theory. That's why the scalar potential was not affected by these guys, because the scalar potential that you get from all these capillaries in the theory is exactly zero. It's a Kremer second thrust theory. Okay, so in the end, how people define how Kremer and Schwartz define these things. So Kremer and Schwartz discuss all these flat gauges starting from a five dimensional ungauge supergravity and by doing a twist of an element of USP8, which is the maximal compact subgroup of E6, which is the relevant one for the scalar fields in 5D. That's okay. The thing is that now we don't have an ungauge theory in 5D because in 5D we come from the five sphere, so there is an SO6 gauge. So in the end, we are a la Kremer consoles, but the only thing we have access to is to the ungauged part of SO6, which is sort of like the three commuting isometries, the three cartons. That's why we get a very specific class of Kremer shared consoles, which is the one in which you have this Kremer shared consoles gauges, which are encoded in matrices like this, are called Kremer shared consoles twists. But now we don't have access to the full Kremer shared consoles in the ungauged 5D. We only have access to the Cartan subgroup of SO6, because this is the piece that respects the fact that we are coming from the five sphere. But still, the piece that we get is essentially V equals zero. That's why, by turning on these actions, we were never changing the cosmological constant, and we were all the time dealing with marginal deformations, and now we know it. So in the end, the example that we push more was precisely this one, the one of starting with the n equals to four and SO4 is full. There are two parameters, chi1 and chi2, that define this specific Kremer shared consoles gauging, or if you want in higher dimensions, the monodromy H, I said before. By playing with these two parameters, chi1 and chi2, we break SO4 in general to the U1 plus U1 carton. We see that what we are doing at the 10 level is, is just this uh, vibration, in particular of the equator bar phi1 of this sphere. When I go around eta, and also the equator of this other S2, when I go around eta. So I get this sort of like non-trivial vibration that locally is trivial, but globally is not. And then we get this beautiful pattern of symmetry breaking. So we got that when the two parameters are zero, chi one and chi two, we are at the most symmetric n equals to four and so four. When turning along, when moving along one parameter, we got the break into n equals to two and u one cross u one. When turning along the diagonal, we got n equals to zero and SU2 plus U1. And when being somewhere in the in this diagram, we got n equals to zero and fully broken U1 plus U1 symmetry. And then in principle, this could be an entire plane, but when you look at the Lagrangian, you discover that there are two discrete symmetries. One is exchanging chi1 and chi2, and the other is flipping the sign of chi1 and chi2. So in the end, the full plane reduces because of these discrete symmetries to what you say, like the octant, just this piece over here. And because of the periodicity in higher dimensions, these parameters, they don't go from zero to infinity, they stop at two pi over t because then they get equivalent. So this immediately brings us to the question that, okay, since this vacua generically and non-supersymmetric and perturbatively stable in four dimensions, uh, are they defining uh, in, from the field theory point of view a non-supersymmetric conformal manifold? Because in principle, this Theories are believed not to exist, but there is no proof. Actually, there is a beautiful paper by Bertolini developing and, and collaborators, like um, working out a bunch of uh, consistency conditions and so on for the existence of a non supersymmetric uh, conformal manifold. But there was no explicit realization of uh, those uh, models, let's say like that. And this is one specific realization respecting all the requirements that they say. And in principle, it could be really the holographic, uh, let's say, the gravitational incarnation of a non-supersymmetric conformal manifold. So then, if you want this to be true, you have to wonder, okay, I buy the package that this is stable in four dimensions because you compute the BF, uh, sorry, the scalar masses for all the fields in 4D, but what about higher dimensions? One should do the same KK spectrometry, compute the masses of the entire tower of Kalusa Klein states, which is something that you can do now due to these exceptional field theories. And what you find is the following. You find that when you focus on the largest symmetric case, the n equals to four and so forth, this was a study in these two papers, and then they noticed that the entire KK spectrum arranges into what is called long graviton multiplets. Okay? This is like a sun-specific supermultiplet that contains all the fields. 
And then you only need to provide the highest weight, uh, the delta, for example, the conformal dimension of the highest weight uh, state and any other state in the conformal multiplet, you know how to generate what delta and so on it has. So as long as you provide the delta of the highest weight state, you're providing all the information. And then they derive this beautiful formula, which is that if you want to compute the delta of the highest state at certain KK level, you have to specify the KK level on the S5, but you also have to specify the KK level on the S1, because those are the two pieces of the geometry. And then at the same time, you only need to specify, you also need to specify in which representation of SO4, which is the symmetry of the solution, uh, are you looking at? Because the different multiplets, they will be characterized by KK level on S5, KK level on S1, and charges uh, SO4 irreps, let's say, like that, SU2 plus SU2 SP of that specific state. So then we thought, ah, computing this for the non supersymmetric thing, when you turn on the guys, it must be like out of reach. I mean, because you break supersymmetries, it must, it must be crazy. But then we thought, well, it cannot be so crazy because in the end, it's a very controlled way of doing things. It's just this global problem that is locally trivial because it's a field redefinition, <coughs> but a coordinate redefinition, but globally, maybe it's not so crazy. And then you try and you sit down and do it. And what you find is that in the end, if you want to compute the masses at any KK level, when the chi's are activated, the only thing you need to do is to replace the two m pi over t that you see here by a new two m pi over t plus some piece that depends on the actions. So you get essentially one piece, which is j1 chi1 plus j2 chi2, where j1 and j2 are this time not the SO4 because SO4 is no longer there, it's just the U1 plus U1 charges of the state you're looking at. And this simple replacement, you can go and check that this is exactly what you get when you compute the masses blindly in the full KK tower. You get numbers and then you understand them and, and, and this is what is called. So in the end, when the chi's are zero, you are stable for sure because it's supersymmetric. So it's an n equals to four SO4. It is supersymmetric in the full KK tower, given by these deltas. And when you turn on the chi's, it's even better because what you have to replace is this quantity by this one. And this one enters as a square here. So it's positive definition. <laughs> so it even gets better when you turn on the guys. Far from being a pathology, it's even better. Let's say like this. So then you prove in this way that these solutions are perturbatively stable, not only in lower dimensions, not in 4D, but in 10 dimensions, even when you take into account the entire KK tower. So then you can say, okay, this is okay, but this is perturbative stability. So what about possible? Uh, decay channels or, I don't know, pathologies genuinely from higher dimension. And then we don't have an answer to this question, but we have done like three different tests or three checks of stability. And of course, I will be very happy to discuss a fourth one or something that could go wrong, but we didn't come out yet with, that, with something that could go wrong. So the first thing we did was to study what is called this brain jet. Now in, in modern terms, it's called brain jet instabilities, but essentially this is, um, Essentially, it's just a probe brain analysis. You have your background in 10 dimensions, put a probe brain there, compute the attractive uh, force coming from the DVIPs, compute the repulsive force coming from the Western Minoterm, and check whether uh, by placing the probe brains in different uh, positions, orientations, and so on, whether at some point when the chi's are different from zero, you get a brain that the repulsive force is uh, larger than the attractive one, so it gets repulsed, it gets to the boundary and destabilizes. The solution. So we made the probe brain analysis for all the DP brains and for the NS5, and we didn't find uh, instabilities. In particular, you find something that you understand after having done the long computation, which is that in the end, when you turn on the chi's, the only thing that you are doing is changing these uh, bar phi coordinates in the geometry by the new ones, which are fiber uh, with the eta. So in the end, if you happen to find a problem when the chi's are different from zero, you would find the same problem for the supersymmetric brain at chi equals zero because of the feomorphisms invariance. So in the end, any single problem you could find for a non-supersymmetric brain when the chi's are non-zero, you would find it mathematically exactly the same for the supersymmetric brain, and you cannot have it because it's supersymmetric. So somehow, <laughs> all these brain jets cannot happen. I mean, they are ex excluded. Then you could also wonder whether there are like these bubbles of nothing that people are discussing now. 
But here, to have the bubbles of nothing, you need some, some manifold to collapse. Here, the S5 cannot collapse because it has an F5 flux. So you cannot collapse. But then you could say, no, but I do it a la Witten. There is the S1 in the geometry, and then that could be the source of the bubble of nothing. But then if you look at that, to have a bubble of nothing, you need your fermions to have antiperiodic boundary conditions on the S1. And when you check what are the boundary conditions of the fermions in this uh, setup, they just come again from the chi, uh, the exponential of chi times eta, let's say like that. Because in the end, when the chi's are zero, the solution is supersymmetric and the boundary conditions are periodic. And when the chi's are different from zero, you get generic boundary conditions. And you don't generate anti-periodic ones, which is what you need for the decay. So in the end, bubbles of nothing will not happen. And then you could also wonder, yeah, but what about some higher derivative corrections that I could think of? Because maybe this is, this is a good background in supergravity, but not in string theory, because I will need the infinite series of, uh, of uh, higher derivative corrections and so on. But here, whenever you compute some Riemann square, some flux square, whatever contribution you like, since the contribution is diff invariant, then you don't see the chi's because the chi's are locally removable by a diffeomorphism. So whenever you try to build an argument based on a diff invariant quantity, you fail. So in the end, we really don't know what could go wrong with these solutions. There must be something going wrong in light of the uh, Swamplan conjecture, ADS decay of non vacuum and so on, but we really don't know what, to be honest, because it's too naive or too simple and too much connected to the SUSI case that we can we don't know what could go wrong. Why not so we could compare them? Well, the conjecture would be wrong. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe we are pushing too much for making it decay. Maybe it doesn't decay. That's true. Right? <laughs> so, am I run out of time or? Yeah, so, yeah sort of. Maybe. Okay, so then I can I can just quickly I can speak this. I mean, in the end, the last thing we did was to consider what could be the field theory duals of these uh, s faults. So we computed first of all an analytic solution in the four-dimensional supergravity when the deformation is off, and then we found a solution like this, which is just the D3 brain. That is the D3 brain written as a domain wall in four dimensions times this piece. But then when C is equal to zero, this piece, this delta function is the one precisely recovering an ADS5 metric with a, with a domain wall slicing. So at C equals zero, we found this solution in here at the four-dimensional supergravity, which is the 4D incarnation of the D3 brain. Then we computed the corrected solution where C is different from zero. We couldn't get it analytically, but we got it as a power expansion in powers of this uh, parameter C. And Z is the radial coordinate, so it's an expansion in powers of C over G7. <coughs> so then we saw that indeed you can get a deformed version of the D3 brain. Let's call it a deformed D3 brain. And then we could build explicitly RG flows connecting, for example, the n equals to four is fold to this deformed version of super jam mills, just by starting from your favorite S fold, perturb with the relevant operators, because we got the S folds in the deep IR. You perturb with the relevant operators, you build the flow numerically, and then you notice that you get to the UV always fitting this deformed D3 brain that I was mentioning before, right? So then we establish what is the net of uh, the, or the web of uh, RG flow. So we could always connect any of the S folds to the D3 brain, but then we could also connect S fold CFTs among themselves, like S fold to S fold, let's say like this. Then interestingly, it is also possible to connect the N equals to two and the N equals to four because they have the exact same energy. And then people realize that they are actually part of the same conformal manifold as well. And here in this conformal uh, manifold encoding the N equals to two or containing the N equals to two and the N equals to four, there is like this puzzle about what is the global properties of this conformal manifold because there is one marginal deformation that seems to be non-compact and in principle this cannot happen in light of these uh, long distance conjectures in and so on. So there are like many puzzles and open questions here regarding the web of uh, RG flows connecting the different uh, s CFTs. And then in the end, just recap, and this is the end essentially, like uh, what we saw is that by turning on this particular case, we have a very controlled, uh, well-defined mechanism of breaking supersymmetries. And then we brought to the table the question about the possible existence of non-supersymmetric conformal manifolds of three-dimensional s CFTs. So this is it. So for the future, we would like to keep on pushing a little bit uh, the non-perturbative stability of these solutions in light of the ADS-Swamplan conjecture. 
also understand the S poles from a 5D perspective, because we know that in 5D, because of the twist, the S dual twist, what we are doing is introducing a dependence on the eta coordinate, and the eta coordinate is a boundary coordinate of super jam mills, so it could be connected to these uh, anisotropic deformations of super jam mills that Alfonso and collaborators and other people they have been studied in the past. It is connected to, in particular, this thing is connected to turning on one forms at the boundary, so really like um, a profile for the eta component of the vector fields, okay, particular for the three vector fields in the Cartan algebra. So in principle, normally these deformations are uh, discarded in light of uh, people use this um, gauge fixing argument, but this time you cannot do gauge fixing argument because the solution is periodic. So you run into large gauge transformations you have to handle with, uh, with more care. Then we would like to keep on exploring if this is really a proof or if in the end, whether in the end there is uh, this non supersymmetric conformal manifold for this specific type to be solutions to supergravity, possibly also like, I don't know, some finite then effects that could create the conformal invariance. Also discuss what are the global properties of the conformal, of the conformal manifold that people have developing now. And then going back to the comment by Alfonso, also to try to understand better what is the brain setups underlying these assholes in, in the line of thoughts of uh, digital details. So this is everything I wanted to say. So thanks a lot. I'm sorry for the time. No, no. Thank you. Thank you.